When was mathematics first applied to biology? So in my humble knowledge, what I found was that back in 1202, a gentleman called Leonardo de Pisa, who was very interested in numbers and mathematics, and in fact, through his father, who was a merchant, was introduced to the Arab system of numbers, he posed and solved a problem on the growth of a population of rabbits that was very ideal. So these rabbits were very ideal in the sense that every pair of rabbits could have offsprings also as a pair of rabbits, one male and one female, and these rabbits had so many carrots that they would not die. So in these idealized conditions, no death for these rabbits. You start with one pair of rabbits and every month they sort of sexually mature, they're able to get pregnant, the pregnancy lasts for a month, and the question is, if you have this hypothesis for your rabbits, how many rabbits will you have at the end of n months? So his solution is nothing else but the Fibonacci series. So Leonardo de Pisa himself was Fibonacci. If you solve the problem, then you start with one, a month later you have one, two months later you have two, and then you continue three, five, eight, and so on and so forth. So what role does modeling have to play in mathematical biology? To me, the main role of mathematical biology coming from the mathematics is this idea that you can define what the variables of interest are, your population, your rabbits, your cells, your molecules, and the hypothesis of how they behave. Do they die? Do they proliferate? Do they migrate? Or do they change? Right. So this is what I think mathematics can do. And by formulating this hypothesis, you may be able to make predictions, as we had said earlier, that we hadn't seen before. So without having to do maybe the actual experiment, if you believe your mathematical model is the right description of the biological process, then you can get the answer. Can mathematics be used to explain human populations? Yes and no. I think the good thing about scientists, mathematicians, is that we're not deterred by whether it can or not. We try. So we've tried with different models of populations. So the first example applied to humans was Malthus in 1798 that made use of an equation assuming that the population growth was linear, which means that the population will increase proportional to how many individuals there are at the given time. But of course, if you assume that this growth is linear, if you wait long enough, your population will become infinite, which may not be a good assumption if your growth depends on resources. And we know that is the case. So in 1838, Fairholst proposed something called the logistic equation to describe population growth. And of course, if resources are limited and finite, as the population grows to a certain size, they will start competing for these resources. So you're able to maintain a population at a certain equilibrium size. And then if you forget about just one single species, if you think that you have different species like predator and prey, Yes, there are also models about predator and prey type of species. And again, you have to assume the prey will grow up in numbers if there are no predators. And the predators require the prey to survive. And what you assume is that the depletion of the prey is proportional to how many predators and how many prey. And by eating prey, the predators will be able to have little predator babies. So is there actually anything mathematics can't incorporate into these models? Well, mathematics is what it is in the sense that you need to put the hypothesis. So maybe you want to say, when is a model going to be right or wrong for a certain population? So maybe to me, that's the hardest question. How are you going to be able to put a model forward that is the appropriate one for the type of population that you're considering? Well, you mentioned the infinite problem. Is it ever possible or useful to have infinite quantities in mathematical biology? So, of course, in principle, there's nothing infinite in this universe, but sometimes the concept of infinity is actually quite useful when we play, and sometimes it's easier to solve something that is infinite than when it is finite. So sometimes if you think your population, in the case of the number of molecules I'm thinking about, or the number of cells, or the number of individuals in a given population is very, very large, then I don't need to worry about is 10 million large or 20 million large, and then assume that the population is infinite. So yes, infinite is not possible, but then sometimes we take it. 
Does mathematical biology apply only to independent organisms or can it also be applied to entities such as cells and DNA? Yes, of course. That's when you start adding complexity to this whole whole thing. So, for example, if you think about DNA, DNA as a molecule, that's something that can be modeled and that's more part of something called molecular dynamics. So there are people carrying out molecular dynamic studies to understand how these molecules may change. And in cells, there are models that, of course, can describe what happens inside the cell, in the cytosol of the cell and try to predict what one would define a cellular fate. If I know the internal machinery, is the cell going to die? Is it going to divide? Or is it going to differentiate? Or is it actually going to migrate and go to a different tissue in the body, for example? But of course, as I've said, that comes at a price that the models become more challenging. And mathematically, that we also called the models will have a greater number of parameters describing every process. Do you think there's any possibility that mathematical biology could be used to help us better understand cancer? That's a good question. And I think mathematical biology has helped at least compare hypotheses. So within cancer, and if, and if we believe that cancer may be associated with mutations, then what one can think about is developing in conjunction with biologists and clinicians some hypotheses about what are the different mechanisms that would be important in cancer development and progression. What is mathematical immunology? Well, so that's something I've been working now for a number of years. And the idea is to make use of mathematics or mathematical modeling to understand how the cells of the immune system behave. So the immune system has a lot so of different types of cells that interact either by direct interaction or by different small molecules that are secreted by some cells and observed by others. So trying to put some mathematical ideas that can help us explain uh, when or when not you're going to mount an immune response to, to a certain infection, for example. How does the immune system actually work? What we know is that the immune system can be divided into innate and adaptive immunity. So the innate immune system is the first line of defense so that very early on, as soon as you get some pathogenic infection, either a virus or a bacteria, it's a first line of defense and it's not specific. And within hours, it will start functioning. The adaptive immune system, which I don't know if you've heard the word of lymphocyte before. So you have white cells called lymphocytes, either called T cells or B cells. They're part of this adaptive immune system and they are more advanced. It's only vertebrates that have an adaptive immune system and their response they mount is extremely specific to the pathogen that is actually infecting the host. It may take up to six, seven days to mount an adaptive immune response, but of course it's usually doing its job in terms of ending the infection. Can you give any examples of the applications of mathematical immunology, such as its use in human vaccinations? So vaccines are nothing else but giving you a little dose of usually dead virus or attenuated vaccines, depending on the type. But the idea is that by giving you a bit of an infection, you are going to be able to mount an immune response, which will start by being innate, but then the adaptive immune response will come into the picture. And something also important and different between the adaptive and the innate response is that after these immune cells, these lymphocytes, clear the infection, a subset of them will actually remain alive, but will differentiate, they will change to cells that are called memory. So these are cells that are longer lived and are there. So if you have a secondary infection, uh, and that's sort of the idea of the vaccine, that if you're ever really infected with the actual disease, you have these memory cells that very quickly will be able to respond and clear the infection. So if we are able to develop models of how these immune responses happen, what are the time scales, what can we do, then we may actually be able to design better vaccines. I mean, one big challenge in the vaccine is always how much of a dose will be good, but not hurtful for the patient, right? So these types of dose, that's something that can be quantified. What is the threshold? What is the appropriate threshold for the vaccine? So that's something which I believe mathematics can help. For sure, it can't hurt. <laughs> 
how does antigen processing work and how can mathematical models be applied to it? So this process of antigen processing is these very specialized cells, either the dendritic cells or the um, macrophages, have in their cytosol, inside themselves, these special sort of regions where these viruses or bacteria are degraded, something called proteolysis. And in this degradation, what they identify, and of course these are cells that know what job they need to do, they chop these proteins that can be antigenic and can be recognized by the immune system. And they're about nine to 12 amino acids long. They are transferred from inside the cell to be presented on their own surface. So they will interact with these lymphocytes called the T cells that can recognize this antigen, this peptide and mount an immune response. In the same way, when your cell is infected, it routinely checks its content. So in the same way, an infected cell will do the same job. Put a bit of the peptide from the protein of a given pathogen, either bacteria or a virus, so that it can be surveyed during the T cell job. And all this happens in the lymph nodes, by the way. Do you think mathematics will ever help us to cure cancer? I think so. I think, well, cancer is a big challenge. Unfortunately, it happens more often than we would like it to be. But I really feel that a joint effort between um, scientists from different areas can only be an advantage when we want to put forward proposals for improvement in therapies of diseases or malignancies such as cancer. So the good news, at least for scientists at Leeds, is that in St. James's there is an amazing group of oncologists and clinicians working very hard and we've recently been talking to some of them. It's also important that the funding agencies are becoming aware of the need of multidisciplinary science. So, yep, I think it would help.